But shall we say then to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? For nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We just thank you this morning, Father. We pause to quiet our hearts and to activate our minds to recognize and to rejoice that you are good. You are good. When life is good, you are good. When life is not so good, you are good. We have this confidence, Lord God, to know that we can trust in you in every season of life. And you'll take even our trials and use them for our good. You'll take our suffering and turn it to serve our eternal joy. What a God you are. And so we thank you this morning that you are seated on the throne. And we thank you this morning that though nations rage against nations, a day is coming when you will demonstrate to every person alive who has ever lived that you are the sovereign lord over kings and nations and we will bow every one of us our need to jesus as lord and we'll confess that he alone is the true lord and for those of us who know you for those of us who've been blood-bought and washed in the blood of the lamb we will say, you are good, so good. Father, I thank you this morning that because of your goodness, we can run into your throne room this morning and we can cry out to you. We can bring our needs and our cares and our worries, our concerns. Lord, this morning we lift up those in our body who are struggling. We pray, Father, that your mercy would be particularly strategically turned toward them in their moment of need. We pray especially for Kara Sabalka as she prepares to have surgery this week. Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, for your protection to be on her young body, for you to guide physicians, for you to give peace, for you to bring healing and recovery and to work out greater purposes than even the physical um, in her life. Father, we pray in this season as a church that you would raise up the men of your choosing to serve, to join our elder team. And we trust you, God, to be working in this process, to be directing our steps even as we pray to make a way for us. Lord, as we anticipate a a building project in the very near future, Father, we thank you, thank you for all the ways you've already provided. We know you'll continue to go before us. But, oh God, in these days, above all else, Make our lives fruitful and effective. Make our witness sweet. And may we have the joy of seeing you draw many to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, now in these moments, as we turn to your word, open our hearts, our minds. Help us to see you as the God who is to be trusted in all seasons, even when we are asleep. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Turn with me in your Bibles to Esther chapter 6 this morning. Esther chapter 6. And again, if you're not real familiar with where Esther is, it's Psalms is about in the middle of your Bible. If you go back two books, Job and then Esther right before that, you'll find where we are, Esther chapter 6. And I hope that today your experience is not like the man who said, they told me, smile, things could get worse. So I smiled, and things got worse. Well, I hope that's not you today, but by the end of Esther chapter 6, Haman, this wicked man who has devised or has been plotting the annihilation of God's people, Haman will not be smiling, and things will be getting worse for him. Let's read together Esther chapter 6. 
on that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. It was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigtha and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Who would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman Haman said to the king, "For For the man the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you've said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing you have mentioned. (laughs) So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gates. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. And Haman told his wife, Zeresh, all, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, You will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Before we jump into these exciting events in chapter 6, we need to take a moment to be reminded of how the stage has already been set in chapter 5 and a little earlier. Having courageously determined to risk her life by uh, approaching the king uninvited to plead with him to save the Jewish people, Esther determined that the best way to prepare the king for her plea was to invite him along with Haman to a special banquet. At that banquet, when the king asked her what her request was, she invited the king and Haman to yet a second banquet the following day, and there she would unveil her plea and Haman's plot to kill her people. So if you're just catching up with us right now in the story of Esther, Haman is this wicked man who's plotting against the Jews, seeking to kill them and annihilate them because of his hatred toward Mordecai, who's Esther's relative. Esther is a Jewish young lady who's at the throne serving as the queen, been chosen as the queen, but nobody knows that she's a Jew in the palace. So all this is unfolding. So Haman gets invited to this banquet and he's elated. (laughs) He and the king only are invited by the queen to this banquet. And on his way home after the first banquet, Haman is so excited about uh, this special honor that he's been given. But when he encounters Mordecai at the king's gate, suddenly his joy is sucked out of him. Once again, Mordecai refused to bow to Haman, which made Haman so furious that he took his wife's advice and had the 50-foot gallows built that very night 
on which he intended to hang Mordecai the next day before feasting again with the king and the queen. Because Mordecai did not want this little barb between him and Mordecai to destroy his joy of feasting with the king the next day. Let's pause here for a side note, can we? The exaggerated pride of a person who lives for the praise of men will make him extremely fragile. That's exactly what Mordecai is doing. He's getting all of his gusto out of the honor or the respect or the praise that he gets from other people, whether it's forced or not. And like a balloon, the more air that puffs it up, the weaker it gets and the closer it gets to popping in utter ruin. Well, last week, Chris did a remarkable job unveiling Haman's character for us. But notice again how Haman's whole emotional life is determined not just by circumstances, but by people's opinion of him. Turn back to chapter 5, verse 9 for a moment. It's important to see this. Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. This is after the first banquet. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, he neither rose, that he neither rose or trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. This is an emotional roller coaster, verse 9. He went from the peak of that roller coaster down to the very bottom in less than a second. All because he did not get the admiration or the respect that he thought he deserved from Mordecai. Now, do you see how his whole emotional life rides on people's treatment of him? He's elated when others give him special attention, special treatment. They love, he loves it when they stroke his ego. But he's devastated and he's enraged when others don't give him the honor he thinks he deserves. And so, he seeks to destroy Mordecai immediately because Mordecai refused to acknowledge him as superior. Now this means that as we come to chapter 6, things are much worse for Mordecai and Esther than they even know. So don't miss this. Do you remember back in chapter 1 we discovered that before we are even aware of a coming crisis, God is at work by His providence to make a way through it for His people, right? Remember that? Well, here we are again. Esther and Mordecai are focused on the decree of annihilation that's been issued against their people, but they have no idea, they have no idea that Haman is planning to have Mordecai executed in the next 24 hours. No idea. So Esther and Mordecai presumably sleep through the night, right? Esther can't appeal to the king for Mordecai's life because she doesn't know about what's happening. Mordecai can't pack his bags in the middle of the night and hightail it out of town because he doesn't know what's happening. But while Esther and Mordecai were sleeping, God was not. Nor was he allowing King Ahasuerus to sleep. He was providentially working in a way that no human being could be credited with. Chapter 6 opens with a seemingly insignificant detail that becomes a turning point in this entire story. On that night, the king could not sleep. Now, on any other night, this could just be passed off as a coincidence or simply a simple case of insomnia, right? But this is not any other night, is it? This is a particular night, the night that the gallows were being built, the night before Mordecai was to be executed, the night before Esther's second banquet with the king and Haman. This is an important night. As I mentioned in my introduction to Esther a few weeks ago, ancient Hebrew thinking did not have a place for mere coincidence. They saw all things coming through the grid, through the filter of God's hand. And it becomes evident that what we see in chapter 6 is actually not coincidence at all, but divine providence when when we see this sleepless night in its full context. 
The first in a series of normal events that become remarkable when they're strung together. So let's just take a moment this morning to walk back through Esther chapter 6 and trace God's providence through these events. All right? First, it just so happened that the king could not sleep the night that the gallows were being built, the night before Haman intended to execute Mordecai. Secondly, it just so happened the king decided to have the chronicles of his memorable deeds read to him in an attempt to cure his sleeplessness. Third, it just so happened that the portion that was read included Mordecai's rescue of the king from an assassination plot five years earlier, bringing to to light the king's oversight of honoring Mordecai. Just notice in verse 2 it says, it was found written. That's an interesting phrase. In light of the fact that we we learned earlier, back in uh, chapter 2, verse 23, that these things are recorded in the presence of the king. It's not like he didn't know about it. Completely overlooked it. Now I want you to keep in mind this morning, it was highly unusual for such deeds to be overlooked. Persian kings were famous for their diligence in rewarding those who assisted them. And this was good not only for public relations, <laughs> but also for the king's personal safety, right? I mean, the word gets around that uh, the king rewards those who are loyal to him, rewards those who protect him, and he kills those who don't. That's a pretty good incentive, right? Not only this, but it's been five years now since Mordecai rescued the king from this assassination plot. And it just so happens that the king was reminded and prompted to honor Mordecai within the very hour that Haman comes to ask for Mordecai's life. Friends, we have a God who knows all about timing. Amen? Fourth, it just so happened... That as the king inquired about who, was, uh, who of his advisors was in the court, verse 4 says, Now Haman just entered the court of the palace. Just, just entered to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he prepared for him. Now remember, the king was still trying to overcome his insomnia when Haman arrived which means he's come at the earliest possible hour of the morning, right? He's waiting there. He's waiting to get an audience with the king. First thing, when the king wakes up, he wants to be the first one in line. Reminds me when our daughter was really struggling uh, with her neck injury, and there was one point in time where things were getting bad, and I was standing at the front door of the clinic when they unlocked the door. Because I couldn't wait another minute to get the attention of our doctor. So here's Haman, standing, waiting for the king to get up after he hadn't slept all night. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of uh, Proverbs 16, 9. The, man of, the mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Haman had no idea what he was walking into. He made his plan. He executed it early, and he walked right into a providential snare. Next, it just so happened, just so happened, before Haman can express why he's there at such an early hour to gain an audience with the king, the king asks Haman what should be done for the one whom the king delights to honor. (laughs) I I love this. I heard you chuckling as I was reading the text this morning, and we should chuckle, right? When we see how, how God works in, in such amazing ways that he causes his enemies to stumble all over themselves, right? And it just so happened that the king, apparently unaware of the bitter hostility between Mordecai and Haman, didn't mention the name of the person he wanted to honor. This is kind of come back on Haman, right? Do you remember how when he was deceiving the king about the decree to have the Jews annihilated, he failed to mention exactly, specifically what people he was going to have wiped out? 
Now, I think Haman did that maliciously. Probably here, King Ahasuerus is doing it absent-mindedly. He seems to be really good at that, too, as we've seen throughout Esther. So Haman, as inflated with arrogance as he was, assumed that he was the one the king wanted to honor. Because after all, he just recently received a promotion, right? And notice what Haman desires for himself. What does he want? Not a promotion. He can't, he can't get another promotion. He's already second to the king. He's as high as he's going to go, right? He doesn't ask for riches. We know he's already a wealthy man, but have you ever met anyone who would turn down more wealth regardless of how much they already had? Be honest. Every one of you would take it. Right? Me too. Right? So what does Haman really want? What Haman asks for will reveal what his heart loves most. And what his heart loves most is public recognition and prestige. For everyone to see how supremely important he is. That's what Haman loves most. Now, do you see the balloon swelling? (laughs) Do you see it swelling? Do you see it stretching? He's already proven that he could manipulate the king to do whatever he wanted. Now to wear his royal robes and to be paraded on his royal horse with a royal crest was as close as Haman could get to being royalty himself. And no doubt the reason Haman specified that this should be done in the city square before the king's gate was so he could rub it in Mordecai's nose. What a nice guy, huh? What a politician. Now, can you hear, can you hear the balloon burst? When the king orders Haman to immediately take the robes and the horse and do so for Mordecai the Jew, that must have been the shock. He must have been horrified. Absolutely humiliated. Haman has to parade Mordecai around proclaiming the king's delight on the man that he hates most. Now notice the difference between these two men at the end of the day. Verse 12 says, Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home to his house, mourning with his head covered. Remember, Mordecai works at the gate, right? So Mordecai just went back to work. Apparently, all this public recognition attention didn't affect him that much. Well, that's done with. Let's go back to work. Right? On the other hand, what about Haman? Well, Haman heads home to pout. Now he is the one mourning, not the Jews, right? Things are suddenly beginning to unravel unravel for Haman, and he knows it. He senses it. So much so that in verse 13, his counselors and his wife said to him, If Mordecai, before, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Here's what's, inter- here's what's interesting. Even these pagans who just one chapter earlier advised him to build the gallows for Mordecai were not so dense as to write off this day's events as mere coincidence. And I'm not sure we should write them off as coincidence either. So, Did all of this just so happen to come about? (laughs) This is not an ordinary day, is it? Not an ordinary day. Notice that the turning point of this story and the destiny of God's people turned not on the courageous efforts of Esther and Mordecai, but on a sleepless night and a series of surprising events for which No single person was directly responsible. Now we're getting close to what chapter 6 is all about, aren't we? Oh, it's true that Esther had acted courageously in chapter 5. 
But when she took that stand, things only continued to get worse, didn't they? For the moment, at least. The turning point is chapter 6, where Esther is only mentioned one time. It's in verse 14, and it's simply because she's absent. She's not even involved in anything that's happening in chapter 6, because she's off preparing a feast, a banquet, for the king and Haman. She has no idea what's transpiring elsewhere in the palace. Mordecai is a little bit more prominent in this chapter, but notice that everything here that Mordecai is involved in is passive except for the simple choice to go back to work. That's all he did. He just went back to work. Everything else was done to him. He had no choice in the matter. So, what's going on in chapter 6? The author is working in such a way to help us realize that the real hero in this period of history is not Esther and not Mordecai, but God who works behind the scenes. It is God's hand work at work. This is not to say that he doesn't use the courageous obedience of his people. Esther will need to be courageous again in chapter 7. But ultimately, neither she nor any other human being is the hero upon which the destiny of God's people depends. It's really interesting, I was thinking this week, like, why is chapter 6 even in the book of Esther? Because on the one hand, well, we wouldn't want to not have it because it's the most exciting chapter in the book. I mean, it's where all this stuff starts to happen and all the irony is there and all the turns of events begin to happen. But actually... God could have delivered his people without any of these things happening in chapter 6. You know that? Notice that? God could have simply given Esther favor the first time she approached the king and he held out his scepter to her. She could have made her plea. God could have given her favor with the king. And this could have all been done. But we would walk away and we would boast about Esther and her heroic activity as the queen, and we would not see the hand of God working mysteriously and powerfully and precisely behind the scenes, directing the course of events. And the author of Esther, a book where God's name is never mentioned, wants wants us to see God like a billboard with neon lighting in the middle of the night. Perhaps we could summarize the message of Esther chapter 6 this way. Though God will work through the faithful obedience of His people, and even through the ruthlessness and foolishness of His enemies, His divine purposes and the destiny of His people rest not on any person, but on His providence. So don't put your trust in men. God may call you to stand and be courageous. He may call you to be a voice for God in difficult circumstances, but at the end of the day, God is the only one on whom you can stand as your reliable rock. So, let's consider a few practical takeaways from Esther chapter 6. Number one, beware of exalting yourself to a place of opposition against God. Beware of exalting yourself to a place of opposition against God. Esther 6 is a warning for all the subtle Hamans of the world who have bought into the lie that life is about making a great name for oneself and being esteemed in the eyes of others. Oh, this happens so much more subtly than we realize, doesn't it? Of course we want people to think well of us, but what measure will we go to to ensure that that happens? This is an effective way to feed pride which contends with God for supremacy but will not win in the end. Remember what Proverbs says, Proverbs 16, 18 Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. 
This is not the only time we see these kind of sentiments throughout Scripture. And in fact, James and Peter remind us that God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Secondly, be encouraged that those who plot evil against God's people plot their own destruction by the decisive hand of God. Nahum found himself up against a promise that God had made to Abraham regarding his people all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. And this promise is repeated over and over and over throughout the Old Testament. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. Wow. That's heavy. God is saying, I'm so closely identified with my people that if they curse you, I will take care of the cursing in return. Or, in the words of Nahum chapter 1, verse 9, whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make a complete end of it. This should be put on Haman's tombstone. Whatever you devise against the Lord, He'll make a complete end of it. Now I realize that None of us like to think of ourselves as Haman, do we? Not in the least, right? But is there something that you are devising that you know is contrary to God and His blessing? And how do you plan on having that thing succeed when you know God cannot give His blessing to it? Learn from Haman how quickly your downfall may come if you resist the Lord or scorn his people. This is a warning, chapter 6. Our downfall can come fast and hard if we are striving against the Lord. Number three, beware of living for the praise of men. Oh, church. We need to be reminded of this so often. Beware of living for the praise of man. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Now I know it may sound like those are two opposite things, the fear of man and the praise of man, but they really aren't. Because when you live for the praise of man, when you live to get whatever recognition or honor or... or um, accolades you can from people you will fear not getting that from them at the same time and guess who's in control of your life at that moment who's in control of your joy and your sorrow the fear of man brings a snare you'll be caught in it but he who trusts in the lord will be exalted and notice here that there is a legitimate way to be exalted isn't there he who trusts in the lord will be exalted by walking humbly with God and trusting Him to, to do the exalting at the right time and the right degree, that's the right way, right? James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you at the proper time. But when you look to people for your significance or your worth, you're not only expanding the balloon of your pride to the breaking point, but also failing, excuse me, falling into the snare of fearing other people's approval. Disapproval, that is. So living in the fear of man, for the praise of man, will make you frail. It'll make you weak. It'll make you unstable. But if you live to please the Lord, you will be secure in His love and His favor. Number four, be encouraged to trust God to be at work when you can't see it and even when you are asleep. Oh, how often do we need to be reminded about this, right? I mean, uh, how often do we just, you know, if we can't see God doing it, then it must not be happening. Right? And how short-sighted we can be. But look to the God of Esther and trust in God's timing. He knows when to reward. He knows when to deliver. God could take care of an imminent danger when Mordecai was not even aware of it. In fact, he not only not knew about it, but he was sleeping. 
If that's true, then certainly He could take care of things we are aware of, right? So don't feed worry. Don't feed it. Pray and go to sleep. Pray and go to sleep. Number five. Beware of your human tendency, apart from God's grace, to set your heart on an idol that cannot satisfy and will ultimately prove detrimental. Now, do you think Haman really would have been satisfied once Mordecai was dead? Do you think Haman was really going to have all his happiness when the Jewish people were annihilated? One of the obvious clues that this was not only evil, but also an actual idol in Haman's heart is back in chapter 5, verse 13, where Mordecai's refusal to honor him took over his evaluation of everything else in his life. This is how you recognize idols, okay? When all that matters is that one thing, right? And your spouse says to you, but look at all the other ways God has blessed you, but nope, that doesn't matter, nope, nope, because I don't have this one thing. I'm losing this one thing over here. And it controls your heart. Back in chapter 5, uh, Haman had, had just recounted to his wife and his friends all of his wealth and all of his family, all of his children, and the prestige that he'd been receiving from the king and the queen. But he said all this was, not, was worth nothing to him because he wasn't getting what he wanted most. And what was that? Mordecai's bowing to him. Haman was willing to kill. That's what idols do. They demand sacrifices of anyone who gets in the way. Oh, we may not actually kill someone, but we stab them with our words, or we suffocate them by withholding our affection, don't we? Church, the only, the only place satisfaction can ultimately be found is in the one who created us to, satis to be satisfied in Him. So beware. It doesn't have to be something as seemingly wicked as Haman's pursuits. There, there are a lot of good things in this world that we can pursue in competition with God's rightful place in our lives. Things like money, prestige, Wealth, cars, houses, you name it. The weirdest things. Fishing poles, golf clubs, tires, pizza with peppers on it. These things become idols in our hearts. We need to see them for what they really are. Jeremiah called them broken cisterns. Jeremiah 2.13 For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's the first thing. They've forsaken God, the fountain of living waters. And secondly, they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They cannot satisfy. They can't meet my need. Because they were never created to have that level of significance in my life. God is the only one who satisfies. You know, it's so easy for us to, you know, we wouldn't, want to, we wouldn't say we think this, but there's a way in which we, we subtly can think to ourselves, I, I know that Christ was crucified, but it means nothing to me as long as I don't have fill in the blank. Where's your joy based? Where's your contentment? Where's your stability? Where's your security? Where's your hope? The last thing I want us to see here is that we should be encouraged that Esther 6 points us to an even greater salvation through Jesus. Esther 6 is the beginning of a great reversal from the enemy winning 
to the enemy beginning to fall, and this by God's hand. Okay? What about us? In our sin, we were the enemy of God, right? That's us. We were the Haman in our sin. His curse, God's curse, was upon us. But the greatest reversal of all history began on another divinely appointed night when a baby was born, the Son of God in human flesh in a cradle of hay. And as Jesus walked the face of this earth, He did so not for public recognition, but the reverse. Listen to how one commentator captures the contrast between the honor Mordecai received and the scorn that Jesus received. And I'm going to adapt this a little bit, but I'm not going to say his name because I can't pronounce it. I have no idea how to pronounce this guy's name. Anyway, listen carefully. Unlike Mordecai, who is dressed in royal robes, Jesus trod the road to the cross, stripped and exposed to public shame. Whereas Mordecai was mounted on a royal horse, which itself was crowned with emblems of royalty, Jesus had to walk, bowed down by the weight of a heavy cross. The only crown in sight that day was the crown of thorns that his enemies had made for him to mock him. Whereas Mordecai was proclaimed publicly as the man whom the king delights to honor, Jesus was derided every step of that bitter way with mockery. Hail, King of the Jews. The climax of God's great reversal reached its peak when Jesus died on a Roman cross, bearing the curse that we deserved and triumphing over the enemies of death, hell, and Satan. And on the third day, God raised Him to life as the decisive an eternal proof of victory, crowning His Son with honor and giving life to all who trust in Him. So we might ask, who is the man that God, the great King, delights to honor? He delights to honor His Son, who will one day lead a great victory parade with His enemies behind Him. And before the sun, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And on that day, you will either be exalted by Him because you trust Him and you love Him and you put your faith in His sacrifice, or you will fall suddenly and decisively. Which will be true of you? Will you be exalted with honor, having loved the Son? Have you put your trust and your hope in Him? Or will you fall under the curse, the eternal curse for despising and forsaking the Son of God, the fountain of living water. Today as we come to the Lord's table, I invite you to come to Jesus. Not just to elements. Not just to a process. Not just to an ordinance. I invite you to come to Jesus. I want to ask you this morning, can you be completely confident that on the last day you will hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant, not because of what you've done, but because of the one in whom you trust. Jesus is not for religious holidays. Jesus is not for religious rituals. Jesus is for every day of life walking with Him, trusting Him, yielding to Him, following His lead, yielding to Him as Lord, experiencing the security of His love, His affection, His his security, His hope. Today I invite you to come to Jesus. For some of you, it may be as simple as crying out to Him today to say, Lord, I need You. 
just earlier this morning before church, Connor and I were just talking for a moment about how that phrase that comes throughout the, throughout the Bible about calling upon the name of the Lord begins in Genesis, I think it's Genesis chapter 5, and continues as, as a way of describing how people come into faith and into a relationship with God as they cry out to God for mercy and receive by trust and faith the mercy He's extended to them. That mercy comes to the person of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I ask you have, you, have you come to the place where you are resting, resting on the rock of Jesus? So let's come to Jesus this morning as we come to the Lord's table. Let's lay down our self-exalting pursuits. Let's surrender our fear of man and our love for the praise of men. Let's forsake our idols that have, we have loved more than God. Let us run to the deep, unfathomable love of God who waits to pour out His mercy and forgiveness on you as you trust in His Son. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank You this morning. What a great, mighty, sovereign God You are. Lord, no, no Haman could outmaneuver You. No Satan, no devil could deceive You. You're the God of great reversals. You reversed the annihilation of the Jews in Esther's day. You, re you, you reversed the curse of sin on us that we experience in our day through the cross of Jesus Christ. And so Lord, this morning, I pray for any person here today <clears throat> who needs you to reverse the direction of their life. From simply living for themselves, doing their own thing, going their own way, to discovering the blessing and the joy and the freedom following Christ and His forgiveness and His Lordship. Lord, meet us today. We just confess today, Lord, we know that we often come with things in our lives that are so stubborn. They, they just stick. Old patterns, habits, sins. But God, You're able to break us free. You're able to cleanse us and to purify us. You're able to give us a new heart. And so, Lord, come and meet us in this way as we turn to trust in you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Gentlemen, come and serve us as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. I invite you to just take some moments to pray, to reflect, to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to the throne of grace.